Take your Bibles with me this morning to John chapter 15. Title of today's message is Friends and Enemies. Jesus continues to instruct his disciples on what they're going to face. How many of you guys know that when you come to Christ, when I come into relationship with, with the Lord, that we inherited a few things, some good and some more difficult? If you're saved here this morning, you, you are a part of a family. You, you have a, a, a brotherhood, a sister. You have a family now. That's one of the great things about being a Christian, the camaraderie throughout the ages. But also, when you came to Christ and I came to Christ, we inherited some enemies. Some, of those, some, of, some who will oppose what we stand for. And individuals, systems, the world system we'll see in just a moment as Jesus uh, instructs these men. Um, we have opposition. And I know most of you don't need reminders of this, but here we are in our text today. And I think it's important. Uh, we have a lot of new believers in here. And I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen again recently. Um, when someone gives their heart to Christ, um, shortly after that, there's going to come a big trial. I just, I've seen it so many times. Their faith is going to be tested. There's going to be difficulty. I don't want to sugarcoat it because Jesus didn't sugarcoat it. When you come to Christ, you must take up your cross and follow him. There are going to be uh, difficulties because you are no longer, we'll see in a moment, a part of the world. You belong to him. And so, this week has been crazy for me. There was like at least four times where I was so close to being in a car accident. People just coming over into the lane and, you know, not seeing me. Like, I, I kid you not, merging on the freeway. I mean, just, it's nuts out here with this construction, you know. <laughs> but God spared me, gave me grace, and, and I just kept praying like, Lord, man, it just seems like all these close calls, like, man, I think the enemy is just trying to discourage me. And, um, but you have an enemy. I have an enemy. And we're going to look at this this morning. John chapter 15 and verse 15. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I've heard from my father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask in the, ask the father in my name, he may give you these things. I command you that you love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they would keep yours also. I'm sure we've all seen the type of interview that I saw this week. Um, several athletes were being interviewed and asked a question. Um, and the question was, who is the most favorite, famous excuse me, person in your contacts? Who is the most famous person that you have in your phone? And can you call them right now to see if they will answer? And uh, as these people participated in this interview, they would name some big names. One of the ladies being interviewed, she's a professional basketball player. She says, I have Steph Curry's number in my phone, but I'm pretty sure if I were to call him right now, he won't, he won't answer. <laughs> Even though they had a friendship, it, it, there were still boundaries to the friendship. Well, this morning, I, I want to talk about a friendship that we have in which there is no longer any boundaries between us and our friend. And the friend that I'm speaking of this morning is the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to me. If you call on him at any time, at any moment, he will hear you. And the great thing about him being our friend is that he is the same 
yesterday, today, and forever. We've all experienced this. We've had close friendships with humans, and over time, either both or one within that friendship, they have, they've changed. They've, they've drifted a different direction, and so the friendship suffers. But I want to tell you something this morning as we begin, that you have a friend in Jesus that will stick to you closer than a brother. He will never leave or forsake you. This week, this has been the meat that I've chewed on as I've thought about this message, that I have a friend in Jesus. You know, <laughs> you, you see it oftentimes in, in songs, you hear about it. Uh, this topic of friendship was, is something that's often referred to in songs. Um, and I'll never forget when I first heard um, the song, we all need somebody to lean on, you know. And, uh, you just might have a problem that he'll understand. Let me tell you, there's a, if any problem you'll face, Jesus understands this morning. You can lean on him. You can lean on him this morning. I want to just encourage us with this in the very beginning. I want you to know, if you do not know him as friend yet, there is a friend request in your inbox, this cross. You see, he suffered and he bled and he died on the cross to bring you to himself. And even this morning, as you have experienced the Holy Spirit maybe tugging on your heart, even during the worship, this is his spirit tugging at you, requesting. He, he, he desires a relationship with you this morning. And I, I want you to know, <laughs> he loves you and he wants to be close to you. And Jesus is going to take some time in these verses to talk about his friendship with us. I want you to notice, first of all, today, our friendship with Jesus, our friendship with Jesus. He says, he describes it in the verses we see below 15. He says, no longer do I call you servants. Now, the, the word there is doulos, and it would have meant a indentured servant, a, a slave, someone who was paying off a debt, so they were working for a master. And he said to these men, the disciples in the room, no longer do I call you servants, even though he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And these men were, in fact, their, his servants. But there would be a new aspect to their relationship. There would be a new uh, truth that they would realize that no longer were they just called servants. He says, for the servant does not know what the master is doing. He said, but I have called you friends. I want you to notice about our friendship with Jesus. There is involvement in what he's doing. Look what he says. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. You see, a servant does not have a close enough relationship to their master to, uh, like a friend would. Normally, a servant would not know what's going on with the master's plans or the master's mind or his business. A servant is simply there to receive orders and to uh, fulfill a role. But Jesus is saying to these men, and what he's saying to us today is that there is a closer relationship I have with you. I have brought you in. I have involved you in the Father's will. You are a part of the Father's plan. And I want you to know this morning, if you are saved, you are, a, you are a part of the Father's will. You have a plan and a purpose within the kingdom. And the Father, uh, he has a, a, a purpose for your life. You, there's no accidents in this room this morning. You see, you are not just a servant, not knowing what the Father and what the Son is doing. He says, I call you friends. He's involved you and I. Let me ask you, how are you involved in the Father's plan? How are you serving the Father as a friend? You know, when good things happen in our lives, we, we go to our friends and we share the news, right? Uh, we, we, we bring them in on personal things. And, um, you know, I heard it said that what everyone's looking for is someone where they could be completely open with and transparent with your best friend, your bestie. You can go to them with your, your darkest 
uh, secrets at times. You can go to them with your biggest burdens. You can go to them and, and, and pour out what's going on in your heart. But I want you to see this is what Jesus is saying. I have poured out my heart before you men. I, I have brought you in on everything that the Father had made known to me. So you are now involved. We are more than just a servant master relationship. You are my friends involvement. But I want you to see Jesus didn't keep any secrets from them. He openly revealed what he had received from the Father. He had allowed them to become, in a sense, confidants. Remember, he would tell them before, hey, the Son of Man is going to be taken. He's going to be crucified. I'm, I'm going to be crucified. He, he would tell them before it would happen. He would involve them and oftentimes, it would fly over their heads. Oftentimes, they, they didn't quite understand it, but he would so graciously repeat himself. And, and this is what we see in the friendship that we have with Jesus. Oftentimes, we miss it. But let me tell you, God is so patient with me and with you. He'll, he'll circle back and he'll, he'll bring us in again. He'll, he, he'll see us strain, but then he will, as a good shepherd, he will, uh, he will cause us, draw us back to him. And, and, and because he is our friend, he wants what's best for us. Our relationship with Jesus, our friendship with him, and it, it is a relationship of involvement. But I want you to see that this was a relationship that came to pass because of his initiative. Look at verse 16. He said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Now, this was very true for the 12. At this point, 11, Judas had been dismissed, but Jesus called each, and, each one of them. He chose them out and they had left everything and, and followed Jesus up until this point. And these men were like you and I. They were flawed. They were broken. They had their issues. They had different temperaments. Peter was a hothead. Uh, he, he had a, a, a problem with uh, his tongue. He didn't keep his tongue. I mean, we can go through it. Thomas was doubtful. Thomas was a, a, a pessimist. We can go through the list of the 12. They had their issues just like you and I, but Jesus chose them. I want you to know this morning, if you're saved, uh, it wasn't because you found Jesus. You know, we hear people say, oh, I heard you found the Lord. No, no, he was drawing. He drew you to him. He wooed you to him. I, he loved you before you even had any desire for him. I want you to get this this morning. He took the first step. He's the one who stepped out and left heaven's glory, came down to this this filthy sod of an earth, and, and he lived a perfectly sinless life and died a, a sinner's death on the cross so that you and I could have a relationship with him. In those times, it was common practice for the disciples to choose which master they would follow. But this is not the case here in the disciples' life and in you and I, our, our experience. Jesus chose us. The Bible says that we love him because he first loved us. Listen to me. As long as I can remember, Jesus was drawing me. I promise you, I can look back and, and I could see where he was uh, drawing me, where his spirit was convicting me, where he was uh, keeping me, even um, to the point where he, uh, he preserved my life when it shouldn't have been preserved. I want you to get this this morning. If you're here sitting in this church or you're watching online, it is only because of the grace of God that you're taking your next breath. It's only because of the mercies that are new every morning that we were not destroyed last night for the sins that we were a part of yesterday. I want you to get this. You didn't find God. He found you. Let that humble you. Because sometimes when we think, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm a religious person. I've followed God my whole life. I meet people like this all the time. You know, I was baptized at five and I don't hang out with people who do certain things. And, you know, I'm, I, and you see this arrogance about them. Let's be real. If we were up to us, if we were left to our own, we'd all destroy our lives. <laughs> But by the grace of God, the Apostle Paul said, I am what I am. And it's because God 
reached out to me. He called my name. Do you remember when he called your name? <laughs> Maybe you were in a church and the gospel was preached. Maybe you were witnessed to by a family member. I mean, just wherever that time was, that point in time where he began to draw you, he worked in your life, I want you to go back to it. I go back to my point often to remind myself that it's only because of his grace. So we see this is really, he said, I have chosen you. You didn't choose me. He said, and he chose us for a purpose. He chose, he chose these men so that they would go forth and bear fruit. And I won't spend a lot of time here because there's a whole message uh, in this series where we talk a lot about fruit. And, uh, but there should be in the life of a believer who's in fellowship with the Lord Jesus, there should be fruit. There should be fruit that remains. And then he talks about how there would be an, uh, a closeness with him and then favor from the Father that whatever you ask in the fa- to ask the Father in my name, he may give you. So we see this morning, our friendship with Jesus is one of involvement. He doesn't treat us as servants. He treats us as friends. He's the one who took the initiative. He's, he called us. He called these men. They didn't choose him, but he chose them. But I want to see, lastly, that our friendship with Jesus should involve intimacy. Intimacy. I want you to see verse the rest of 17. Verse 17, he said this, These things I command you, that you love one another. So he's going to circle back to what he was saying in our verses proceeding about loving each other. Because of the love that we've received from him, we are called to love one another. And so it, it all is rooted back to our closeness with Jesus, intimacy with Jesus. And I want to ask you this question this morning. Uh, where are you with your relationship with the Lord Jesus? Could it be described as an intimate, thriving, growing relationship? Do you love the Lord Jesus more than life, more than loved ones more than anything else in this world. This is what he's called us to do. You know, oftentimes we, we are, we've met Christians who, you know, they are, they're very good at keeping rules. They're very good at putting on the, the, the front, but their heart, eventually their heart comes out and, and it, and it sh- shows that there was a lack of intimacy with him. I, when I went to seminary, I've learned this in my own life. There were times in, when I was in seminary where I was backsliding away from God with a Bible under my arm, going to chapel five days a week, reading the Bible for you know, assignments. It became a textbook for a season in my seminary time. It, it, there was not the intimacy. Uh, there was a coldness there. And then it became like a servant-master relationship. I knew what God wanted me to do, so I did it, and I did it begrudgingly at many times. I did not have a desire uh, out of intimacy and love for him to serve him. It was like, I know I have to do this. I remember in in seminary, we'd have to fill out a ministry report and um, to to make sure that we were doing certain requirements. And one of the requirements was to go and what we would call soul winning. We would go and knock on doors. And if you did not, if you did not get your, uh, your, your door knocking done, then you would get demerits. And demerits, you know, you wouldn't be able to do certain things. And it, it, it began to, uh, it would be a, not a good look, okay? Especially if you're in seminary to be a pastor. And, and, uh, and I remember there were times when, you know, I, Shoot, it was, it, you had to turn it in on Sunday night after the, the 5 p.m. service. And I remember that whole week, I, you know, I had not been close to God. I had no desire to tell anybody about Jesus. And, and I remember I would have to, uh, in order to be honest on my, my report, I would have to, I would go to a gas station with a few tracks in my hands and just say, here, I have some good news for you. Here, ha- you know, here you go. Here, take this, take this so I can go fill out my report. Yeah. <laughs> 
I was thinking about it the other day. On the flip side of that, when God is working in our lives and our hearts and we have an intimacy and a love for Jesus Christ, it can't help but to spill out. We can't help but to witness. We can't help but to want to be a part of what he is concerned with. And I want to ask you today, do you have intimacy with God? Not just in relationship, not just a nominal, minimal relationship with God, but do you intimately desire Jesus? And is that love being poured out on others? From that love is where we will make the difference in this world. And I want to just encourage us this morning. Remember the friend that we have. and What a friend we have in Jesus. All our griefs and pain to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. There's an intimacy. You see, a, a person who is close to Jesus, it's not a hard thing to worship him. It's not a hard thing to pray. It's not the Bible comes alive. Let me tell you this. It's not just a textbook of information. You, you want to hear his voice. You, you desire him. It's shown in our appetites, right? Isn't it? I've changed my diet the last two months, right? I've been here for five years, right? Listening to our pastor, <laughs> Listening to being under conviction, sitting right there, you know, um, but struggling like some of you. You know, I live like a mile away from in and out. And sometimes when I'm walking outside, if I take a deep whiff, <sighs> and though, <laughs> you know, the, the food, the fast food and the, the junk and the sweets and and um, they taste good going down. It was, it's, it's killing us. You know, I'm just being honest. It's killing me. And um, so something clicked. And um, with the help of some people in our church, they, they put me on to something that's working for me. And, and now there's a desire. My daughter baked the cake the other day. And, of course, the kids come running in. Look, let, she finished the cake. You want some cake? <laughs> and I'm like. No, I'm okay. I'm all right. Listen to me. I'm, I was a can. I've shared with you guys my addiction to sugar and candy. This is the longest I've ever gone in my life without having candy. I went, took my wife to the movies a few uh, times during this this season, and I just I packed. You know, I I'm gonna confess my sin, but I packed my stuff and brought it in with me. Okay, I put some fruit. My wife always carries the big purse, right? But I put some blueberries, blackberries, strawberries, you know, <laughs> in a bag, you know, and I've been, I've been trying to, not perfectly, guys, I'm not, not perfect, but, but I've been trying to do what's right. And, and in the beginning, it was more drudgery, right? Man, I, want, I really want that double-double. I really want that chocolate chip cookie. But after a while, after I started to feel better, after I started to sleep better, after the pounds begin to come, now is a desire. I, I'm loving it now. I'm, I'm, I'm appreciating, you know, what God has given and the grace he's given me to do this. And, and so there's a love now for it, so it's not as hard. It's not nearly as hard. Now, is there still the pool? Yes, I still drive by in and out. Yes, I, you know, I still, I had one this week. I did have a a three by three. Okay, because no one's perfect, right? <laughs> it was after Wednesday night. I, I was, yeah, anyhow. <laughs> but I'm sharing this, you guys. I'm, I'm, I try to be transparent in my messages. So I know there's someone else in here who you, you're, my, you're right where I am, you know. But I want you to get this illustration. When you love Jesus, when you love him, it's a joy to obey him. It's a joy to do what he tells us to do. It's a desire. It becomes a desire. Now, at first, it may be a struggle. But as we, by the power of the Holy Spirit, deny the flesh and allow the Spirit to work in our lives, there will be a 
closer intimacy. There will, there will be fruit. There will be joy that comes from the obedience we talked about last week. And so I want to encourage you, if today you feel far from God, you don't feel the intimacy, you don't have a desire for the things of God, I want to encourage you today, even maybe before you take communion, to, to forsake whatever is keeping you from being close to Jesus. You know, little things can come between us and Jesus. Things like food, things like, uh, you know, the wrong friends. I mean, little things could stop the intimacy. So we see our friendship with Jesus. It's one that he has involved us in. He initiated and he desires intimacy in. But I want you to see secondly this morning, our common foe. Look at verse 18. If the world hates you, <laughs> you know that it hated me first before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world will love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. I want you to understand this this morning. We have a common foe. And the Bible talks about that the world. Now, what is it saying there? What is the world? See, we as Christians, we understand that the world is a system, okay? The world is, from a Christian point of view, it, it involves people, plans, organizations, activities, philosophies, values of society that is counter of what we believe as Christians. Amen? You understand this? We have been called out of the world. Listen to me. We, we aren't to go to Idaho and, and build a cabin and, and isolate ourselves. I don't believe what our, our Amish brethren are doing is what God intended. And some may disagree with me on this. You say, well, I was thinking about becoming Amish because my taxes are coming up. <laughs> Some of y'all, I'm sorry. <laughs> but hear me out. Jesus said to, he, we're going to see in John 17, he wants to keep us in the world, but to keep the world out of us. Listen to me. I could be on the, on the ocean, the, the Pacific Ocean in a boat, right? And I'm fine just as long, I won't sink just as long as the the water from the ocean doesn't get inside my boat, right? And I want you to get this. This is the picture here. The world wants to infect you and I. It, it wants to come in and influence us. The media, the, I mean, everywhere you look, the, the, the values, the, the, the church is always un, in, on the, the sea of the world trying to keep the world out. Because... The world and its systems have been set up, been set up by the enemy of our souls. Lucifer, I want you to know he's at the head of this. You know, we talk about things, you know, you know, I can go down some what some people will call conspiratory type of information. But there's a reason why there are places like Bohemian Groves. Why CEOs and political figures go to the woods and worship through these, these rituals, these demonic entities. And then their businesses, they seem to get the deals. They seem to get, there's a reason why, and I'm sad to say this, like Chick-fil-A is now having a DEI department because they were told if they do not get on board that they would lose their contract to get their supply of chicken. There, listen to me, if, if after the last four years you are still asleep, <laughs> then nothing's going to wake you up. I just want to be honest. I was thinking about the world, and, and if you are a Christian, <laughs> there should be an increasing distaste for the world and its system. Listen to me. The world hates us. <laughs> And they, they don't pull punches. We're going to see it in a moment. Jesus said, our common foe would be inherited. We didn't get to choose this foe. Some of you say, I don't want to be at odds with the world. 
I don't want to have to fight the devil, the world, and its system. I don't want to have to deal with this. Well, I'm sorry. We don't got a choice. You see, friendship with God leads to the world's hatred. And there's a progression to this. I want you to understand. It starts with persecution. Jesus talks about it. Then it starts to, uh, then we are ostracized. We're, we're, once we're persecuted, then we become ostracized. We, we, we get, in a sense, banished from society. And then the next step in that is death. It becomes the, uh, to the point where they believe they're doing the world a favor by eradicating us. And you can see this progression in, in many nations around the world. The, the, the nations under the communist rules of like China and others, they don't, they are not very friendly to Christians. And many times they put Christians to death who do not submit to the government. And so when we see people in America protesting for things like communism and <laughs> listen to me, these people have no idea what's influencing them. They're being influenced by the world and the devil himself. The devil, <laughs> he's very slick. And his tricks, they, they don't really change. But I want you to get this. We have a foe. Remember this, that friendship with God leads to the world's hatred. Hatred. But on the other side of that, the flip side of that, being friends with the world is to be God's enemy. James 4. Do you not know that friendship with the world means enmity with God? Listen to me. <laughs> you do not want to align yourself with this world. This is why when I see preachers aligning and Christian artists aligning with the world and they only speak out on the things that the world says that they can speak out and they only endorse the candidates that the world tells you you can endorse and they only, listen to me, I'm, I see this allegiance to the world, this desire to be accepted by the world and it's going to always be to their detriment. Listen to me. Listen to me. <laughs> Jesus alerted his disciples of this, that they would face the hatred of the world and um, the hostility of the world. And he's, he, in, in a sense, and these men, I want you to hear, they wore this with a badge of honor. They knew that if they hated Jesus, who we saw him, he was absolutely perfect. We live with him. We experience his glory. They, hate, they hated him, and now they're hating us. And they found it an honor to die because of their friendship with the Lord Jesus, because of their association with the Lord Jesus. And I want you to, I don't, I don't want us to miss this point. We should be living for the approval of God, not the world. And if the world hates us, we're in good company. We should be, man, okay, I'm doing something. I, I keep saying this. It, it just keeps coming up that if we are doing Christianity the way that the Bible lays it out, that we are going to have enemies. People are not going to like us, okay? I don't know where it came along, this concept that Christians, that we're just supposed to be these people who never stir up the pot, never cause any controversy, <laughs> Show me that in the Bible. We are, listen, we are to live peaceably in our world. We ought to pray for those in authority. But do you know that Jesus said, I, I didn't come to bring peace, but I came to bring a sword. I came to cause mother and daughter to be at odds. I came, I, listen to me. And if we are Christians, little Christ, <laughs> in a sense is what that means then there should be a friction between the way that we are living our human experience and the world. And it should cause them to be uncomfortable. I, I just, I, I just, I'm just preaching the Bible this morning, amen? And so, our common foe is inherited, inherited. We, we just because of who we are, there should be some opposition in this world. And I want to just encourage us not to love, not, don't fall in love with this world. Don't fall in love with the, the fool's gold that is presented to us in this world. I was looking at 
once again, I was watching the video and was talking about how, you know, Tom Brady, is, you know, he's, he's going through a divorce and he knew, I guess he knew, he, he saw the, <laughs> he saw the writing on the wall a while back because every one of his assets was under his mother's name. I don't know if this is true, but this is what the, this video was saying. <laughs> So even though his, his former wife, Giselle, is worth significantly more than him, she was going to take him for half of what he had too, right? And uh, he, he told us a lot about her when he, he admitted that she would cast spells so that he would perform better in games. She was, she's a whole witch. <laughs> but anyways, it looks like she's not going to get anything because it's under his mom's name. And I'm telling you, the world will say Tom Brady is successful by all he, – he's made it. He's at the top of the top, the most decorated quarterback in the history of the game. But his life was built on a sinking sand foundation, and it's crumbling. He may have all the wealth. He may have influence and fame and all these things, but I promise you what he probably doesn't have today. He doesn't have joy. He doesn't have peace. He doesn't, he's not experienced the fullness of the love of God. And I'm going to pray for him. I, I'm praying for him. <laughs> As I saw this, I'm like, man, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Listen to me. Don't believe what the world is selling because it's a lie. It's established by the father of lies. We should not be surprised by the hostility of the world because Jesus, he's given us the heads up. But I want to tell someone here today, wear it like a badge. Don't be, don't let your attitude and your, don't be prideful in this. We always have to preface that because some people, they are just obstinate by nature. They are disagreeable by nature. And, you know, some of the leaders, of, listen to me, and that's not a bad thing all the time. Um, sometimes confrontation is necessary, right? But I want us to know we should be as wise as serpents, but as soft as doves. We should understand the times that we're in, and we should navigate them by the Spirit's leading. Because we're in a world that is in opposition to us, and we should not love this world. 1 John 2 and verse 15, you've, you've heard this verse before. Do not love the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We can't do both. We, we can't successfully love God and the world. we got to love, choose who we will love, who we will serve. Amen. Our common foe is inherited, but I want you to know it's, it's indicative. Listen, look at verse 19. If you are of the world, the world will love his own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. I want you to see an indicator that you are in Christ, that you are a friend of God, is that the world hates you. That's an indicator. We're not aligned with the world. The fundamental reason behind the world's hatred for Christians is the difference between us. Those who are not in Christ, I'm, I, I don't say this happily, but they are, they are children of the God of this world. A believer is a child of God. There's different and kingdoms. Like we've, we've said it many times here that we are seeing in our culture kingdoms colliding. This isn't just political issues. This is kingdoms colliding. The kingdom of darkness has an agenda. The kingdom of darkness has its leader. The kingdom of darkness has its prophets. The kingdom of darkness has its foot soldiers. Listen to me. But the kingdom of light, we know we have victory. <laughs> Number one, we're victorious because of our king, King Jesus. But we are a part of that. Like I said earlier in the message, you, when you came to Christ, you became a part of something. Something bigger than yourself. And in every man in this room, there is a desire. I see it in my young son already. There is a desire to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. And let me tell you, you don't have to look to this in other areas if you're a Christian. You can look at the kingdom of heaven and you can see that we're in a battle against the kingdom of darkness. Are we fighting the good fight? 
Are we active in this fight? I want you to get this. We are friends with Jesus. That's, that's the greatest thing. And I want you to know, and I was just thinking about this, the Bible talks about Abraham, how God, he was called a friend of God. And there's, there's so many benefits to this friendship. We have insight. You know, one of the great illustrations of this is Abraham's life. Um, you guys remember in Genesis 18 when Jesus showed up with two angels to Abraham's tent? And uh, Abraham recognized them. I don't know how. Maybe they had had some previous interactions. But he saw them coming and he killed the, the fat calf. He, he prepared the best meal. Really, He got up. He was in his 90s. But he got up and he, the Bible says he hastily prepared this for his Lord. And he, they had a meal. And Jesus told Abraham, this time next year, your wife will give birth to your son. And we know Sarah laughed. <laughs> and Jesus said, why does she laugh? And she denied it. And <laughs> Because she laughs, you're going to name your son Isaac, which means laughter. I see my boy Isaac up here in the front. <laughs> There's Isaac here. Um, laughter. But the rest of the story is this. They start to walk and to leave, and they, they start to walk towards a city. Anybody know the name of the city? Sodom, right? And as they're walking, Abraham's walking alongside them for a little while, and, and he says to the, Jesus says to the angels in front of Abraham, he says, and the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? And the rest of the story is that God told Abraham what he was going to do, that he was heading to Sodom to judge it. And uh, Abraham was the servant of God, but he was the friend of God. And he got to be a part of God's work. You see, Abraham, when he heard the news and he knew that his nephew Lot and his family was, was in the city, Abraham began the work of intercession. Would you save, would you spare Sodom if there's a hundred righteous men? Fifty. Ten. <laughs> and he, he began to intercede. And I want you to understand, when there is an intimacy with God, you see things differently. And eventually, in that relationship, you, you begin to have his heart and you'll find yourself in the role of an intercessor. Some of you, right now, that's where you are. Maybe you're a mom. See, a mom loves her children with all, and I've never seen anyone pray for their kids like a mama prays for her kids. It's because of that love for them, that intimacy with them. And I want you to just get this. This matter of being a friend of God, it is multifaceted. Jesus would send all these men out into the harvest. He would send them out to preach the good news of salvation because this is what his heart was about. And let me ask you, even though we live in a day where it's becoming increasingly difficult to stand as a Christian in our culture, I want, to, I want you to ask yourself this question. Am I burdened or am I bothered by what's going on? You could be both, but... Let me tell you this, you should be more burdened for those who are lost and blinded by the God of this world. And church, when we get to that point, that's when we will spring to action. That's when we will become intercessors. I want to encourage us in that. Jesus talks about our friendship. What a friend we have in Jesus. I want to encourage you today, if you are here today and you don't yet have that relationship with Jesus. You can't say that you are a friend of Jesus. I want to encourage you today to come. You can call on his name and he will save you. He will give you eternal life. This is what this is all about. He sent you, like I said before, a friend request when he died on the cross and he rose from the grave three days later and he did so for you and for me and for the world. 
And he desires that none would perish, but that all come to repentance. And I want to encourage you today, if you do not have the assurance that when you die, you will be in heaven, I want to encourage you today to open your heart, to heed God's call to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And it's just simply by faith. When you came in here this morning, did you just put one of your fingers on that chair before you sat down because you weren't sure? No, you, you sat down. You put your complete faith that that chair would hold you up. Amen? Well, salvation is the same thing. The Bible says, whosoever believes in him will have eternal life. That means placing your faith completely in his finished work, completely in what he's already accomplished on the cross. Not him and your baptism, not him and your Christian service, not him and your Christian pedigree. It's Jesus and Jesus alone for salvation this morning. Do you know him? And I want to remind us of our foe, the world. Its system is not our friend. Let's not cozy up. You wouldn't cozy up in a bed where you knew there was a rattlesnake, would you? <laughs> the world hates us. And so we ought to love people. We ought to uh, be kind in a sense. But we've got to understand that if they hate it, if the world hated Jesus, they're gonna, it's going to hate us too. And so we must live and, and be prepared for the persecution. It's coming, y'all. Be prepared. And when it happens, don't, don't get angry with the Lord. <laughs> don't, get, don't get resentful. Don't go into hiding. Don't, I mean, wear it as a badge of honor. Listen to me. I, I want to, we must determine now <laughs> that when the persecution comes, when, when it gets difficult, we're going to stick by the stuff. We're going to stick by our Savior. We're going to, uh, we are not going to bow down to the culture. We are not going to compromise what we believe to be true in order to be accepted in the world. Decide now and ask for grace in the moment. There may come a time where we, our lives are on the line. But I want you to know <laughs> When we are willing to suffer with him, we will also share in his glory. And if you deny God now in front of the world, he will deny you in front of his father and the holy angels. Listen to me. Let's hear his words and let's take heed.